lesson for this, the fourth Sunday of Easter, is taken from the book of Acts, the 13th chapter. After the reading from the Law of the Prophets, the synagogue rulers sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a message of encouragement for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Men of Israel and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. Brothers, children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. But God promised our fathers he has fulfilled for us their children by raising up Jesus. As it is written in Psalm, the second psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Then came the Feast of Dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple area, walking in Solomon's colonnade. Jews gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me. But you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord our Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Today is, uh, of course, Mother's Day, and a blessed Mother's Day to all the moms. Uh, but it is also uh, the fourth Sunday of Easter is always Good Shepherd Sunday. Uh, a couple Sundays ago, when we had the second Sunday of Easter, I, there was something that was unusual in the liturgy, in that uh, that second Sunday of Easter. The text appointed for the gospel is always John chapter 20, and it's always exactly the same verses. Here we have something similar today in that uh, Good Shepherd Sunday. Uh, the text is always from John 10, and uh, where Jesus talks about the, himself being the Good Shepherd and talks about his sheep. But unlike that particular Sunday where it's always the same verses, uh, on the fourth Sunday of Easter, it's different verses from John 10. So here we're picking up on the last verses, actually, of John 10, uh, the later part of, of that reading. Uh, but again, with the imagery of Jesus as the shepherd and we as his sheep. So if you take a look at the uh, gospel lesson again with me, uh, I'd like to, to do some uh, discussion of that. The text says, Then came the feast of dedication at Jerusalem. Uh, and it was winter, and Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colony. Um, so, the Feast of Dedication, first of all, this is telling us that he had just come back to Jerusalem. Uh, we don't know where he was between now and uh, probably sometime in October. Uh, but the Feast of Dedication is what we call Hanukkah. Hanukkah. And Jesus is celebrating Hanukkah. Christians don't celebrate Hanukkah, do they? Jesus did. Now what are you going to do? It's Hanukkah. And actually, it's kind of cool that we see this, that Jesus is doing this, because it reminds us of a couple things. And probably the most thing, important thing it reminds us of is that traditions are not necessarily bad things, that Jesus himself kept traditions. Now, why do I say that? Because the Feast of Hanukkah, like the Feast of Purim in the Old Testament, are both uh, feasts that were not commanded by God. Now, there are feasts that are commanded by God. Passover, for example, Pentecost, another one. But these two particular feasts were not commanded by God. God's people took it upon themselves to celebrate these. Purim, if you read the book of Esther, was to celebrate God's deliverance of the Jews from evil Haman and his desire to destroy them. And then Hanukkah is uh, a recognition of the rededication of the temple in 167 B.C., after Antiochus Epiphanes had desecrated the temple, uh, he had sacrificed a pig, right? And the pigs were unclean animals on the altar. And so uh, if you read the Maccabees, uh, the uh, Apocrypha tells us about this history uh, between the two Testaments and uh, that uh, God's people were victorious. They reclaimed the temple. And here's Jesus celebrating Hanukkah. Now, in our day and age, Hanukkah has become the alternative to Christmas. It need not be. Uh, 
In fact, uh, I know Jewish Christians who still celebrate Hanukkah, and good for them. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a good tradition. But the point is, it's a tradition. Traditions in and of themselves are not bad or good. It depends on the tradition. Okay? And Jesus kept Purim, and Jesus kept Hanukkah. He didn't just throw these traditions out and say, oh, they're traditions of men, they're evil, they're wrong. No, he kept them. Whenever we're dealing with a tradition, we have to ask the question, does it support God's word? Does it remind us of something about God? Or does it, in some sense, get in the way of God's word? If it supports God's word, as Lutherans, we're all for traditions. You all keep a lot of traditions that even your Protestant brothers keep, and they don't realize they're traditions. Sunday worship that we're worshiping today on Sunday is a tradition. There is no command in Holy Scripture to worship on Sunday. The early church did. In fact, by the time it comes to the book of Revelation, it's called the Lord's Day. And they chose to worship on Sunday. Why? Because that's when Jesus was raised from the dead. It had great meaning. It was the eighth day. It was the beginning of the new creation, the resurrection. And so uh, they kept it. There's no command to keep it. It's a good tradition. You shouldn't get rid of it. We just celebrated Easter. There is no command in the Bible to celebrate Easter. Your Protestant neighbors all celebrated Easter too. There's no command. It's a tradition. I think it's a great tradition. Because it celebrates what? The resurrection and reminds us of that. And in a few months, I don't know, does anybody, is anybody counting the days until Christmas yet? It seems to come early and early. So maybe you have to, and I don't know. But Christmas is a tradition. But a good tradition. So traditions are not bad or wrong in and of themselves. In fact, they are and can be very helpful. Uh, many times with traditions, I like to say that we confess with our actions and what we say with our lips. A few moments ago, we said we believed in one holy Christian church. By keeping traditions, you show you believe in one holy Christian church. You don't act as if, well, we're the only Christians who ever exist, and all that matters is what we do today. But you recognize what? That you're in line with all the saints who have ever gone before us, all those who called upon Christ in the history of the church. And that's a pretty cool thing. And so Jesus here is keeping a tradition. Now, he's walking in Solomon's colony, which brings us to another tradition, another point. And that is, the temple at Jesus' time was created by a pagan. It was called Herod's temple. And there were many Jews who were upset about this and wondered about the legitimacy of the temple because this guy Herod, who wasn't even a Jew, who was a pagan, had built the temple. And yet Jesus refers to this very temple as my father's house. You see, where something comes from doesn't determine its value. What determines its value is what you're doing with it today. So you have people who want to say, oh, you know, Christmas has pagan roots or whatever. You know, there's all these conspiracy theories out there. And my comment to that is... What it was in the past says nothing about what it is today. For Jesus, Herod's temple was my father's house. Because that was still where sacrifice was going on. Uh, it was built on the temple where Solomon had built his temple according to God's command. And so we need to be a little more sophisticated in our argumentation and understanding of uh, not all traditions are bad. Not all traditions are good. That something has connect, something meant something in the past doesn't mean it means it today, but it could. And we have to ask that question. What does it convey today? But here is Jesus celebrating Hanukkah in Solomon's colonnade in Herod's temple. 
Now, the Jews gather around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, and how you listen to this, I think, makes a difference. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. And then he says, the miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me. Now, I think that this should be read in this way. How did he tell them plainly? By what he was doing. In other words, if you've been in any of my Bible classes, he's saying what? I may not be going around making level one statements. Hey, I'm God. Nice to meet you. I'm the Messiah. How you doing? But on level two, you say what? Actions speak louder than words. <laughs> he's doing all these things that anybody who's open to hearing what God has to say is going to go and say what? He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. And that's actually what his believers then say and how they think of him. He's saying to them, look, you should be understanding what's happening here, what I'm doing. And then he says, you do not believe because you are not my sheep. And so this, I think, fits in with you, like I said, from my Bible classes where I make a big point out of this, that Jesus doesn't normally go up to people and say, hi, I'm the Messiah, nice to meet you. But rather, he does things that are messianic. He does things that are divine. And he wants you to draw the conclusion that he's the Messiah, that he's the Son of God. Okay? And that doesn't mean he never said it. He does. In fact, one instance where he says it clearly is when he's put under oath by, by, uh, by the high priest. And he says, yes, I am the Christ, as you have said. Because he was put under oath. He says it in clear language. But he's basically saying, look, you've got all the evidence you need. You just don't want to believe. People often say, well, I would believe in God if I saw a miracle. Yeah, because that's got a great track record. <laughs> all these people heard, saw, even personally experienced these miracles, and still some of them would not believe. Indeed, Jesus says in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, he says, uh, they have Moses and the prophets. If they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't even believe if someone rises from the dead. He says this before his resurrection. They won't accept it because they're always looking for more. How different are his sheep, you and me? Verse 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Um, now, by the way, this is the basis for Luther's famous comment in the Lutheran Confessions. Thank God even a seven-year-old knows what the church is. It's sheep who hear the shepherd's voice. That's the una sancta, the one holy Christian church that we confess in the creed. All God's sheep who hear the shepherd's voice. And it talks then about an attitude of willingness to listen to the good shepherd. And so God's children are found in various church bodies and various denominations because every believer wants to hear the good shepherd's voice. And they may be part of a church that doesn't believe correctly, that teaches falsely, not because they don't want to hear the shepherd's voice, but they've been told this is the shepherd's voice. But as soon as they are corrected, as soon as they are shown what the shepherd actually has said, his sheep want to hear his voice. I tell people, I've been in 30 some odd years in the ministry now, uh, when I was young in the faith, there were things I believed back then that I know better today. And I've changed my mind on and my opinion on. Why? Because I've heard the shepherd's voice. I've studied Holy Scripture, and I've learned more. And I've learned that sometimes other voices are there, and they drown out the shepherd's voice, and we think they're the shepherd's voice. But as soon as we hear the shepherd's voice, we say, Amen. 
It is true. This is most certainly true, as Luther says, at the end of the three articles of the Creed. Because why? Because it's the shepherd's voice. They trust, we sheep, we believers, trust the shepherd. We trust him because we know what he has done for us. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Your sin and mine. And so there is a huge trust component for the sheep with regard to the shepherd. And so they believe things, the sheep believe and confess things by faith, not by sight. Yesterday we had a, a wedding here, and I talked about that, that holy confesses that something has come from the Lord. That we recognize when we call it holy, that God gave it, in spite of what it may appear to be. And as I said, we confess one holy Christian church. Now, the sheep are holy, and they're not so holy. They're holy because they're covered in the blood of Christ. Their sins are forgiven. But they still must pray every day, forgive us our trespasses. We live by faith, not by sight. It's a holy Christian church because God says it's holy. In Jesus. A moment ago we sang, baptized in Christ, I gladly say it, God's own child, the firm. Holy baptism, <coughs> which makes you and me holy. <coughs> no man came with that, up with that, but God did that. He <coughs> instituted that. And he says, through that, you are my child. Whether you feel that way, whether other people see you that way, this is God's word to you. It is holy because it comes from the Lord. And in a few moments, you're going to be receiving the body and blood of Christ in the sacrament. And call it, guess what? Holy communion. Because we go there to receive what Christ has given for us and place there for us that we might have the forgiveness of our sins. This is what Jesus means when he says, too, later on, that no one can snatch them out of my hand. He has provided for us the means of grace, and because of that, he protects us through that. Now, of course, you can walk away from them. Luther uses the imagery of, for baptism. He says the early church got confused about baptism, and they talked about, you know, that the... Uh, your baptism is like the ship of salvation. And we're like, by the way, that's why we're in a ship here, if you ever notice that. Right? Architecture says something. You're in the ship of salvation, and the church said, well, what if that ship gets shipwrecked? Then they said, you, you make it to salvation on the plank of penance. And they came up with this sacrament of penance, right? And Luther says, no, the ship of salvation is God's. It cannot be shipwrecked. But you can jump out. And then what's the answer? Get back in the ship. Come back to the promises of your baptism. Trust and believe in them and rely upon them as Christ would have you do. You don't have to do anything else. Just come back to Christ and the means he's established for your salvation. Now this text is so multifaceted. It's wonderful. Uh, notice, I give them eternal life. Not that they earned it. It's a gift. And then he says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, greater than Satan even. And no one can set on my father's hand. And then he says, I and the father are one. And the text goes on, and a little later on he says, I am in, the father is in me and I am in the father. And this text, I and the father are one, refer to what we say in the Nicene Creed, being of one substance with the father. This term, this term uh, consubstantial, uh, homoousius in the Greek was uh, developed by the church to make this point that what is true of the Father is true of the Son in their essence. And it means more than here just being in like, like minded or something like that because Jesus not only says the Father is in me he says I am in the Father. 
And so this is talking about essence, and I think the church has always understood this properly as more than simple agreement amongst the Father and the Son. But this is a confession of the deity of Christ, that he is true God. And that's a good thing. In the book of Revelation, we had the imagery of the Lamb. Today's Good Shepherd Sunday, where I talk about the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It is a good thing that he is God. And it's a good thing that he is true man. Both of those things are good things for us men in our salvation. To become the lamb, he had to become a man. To lay down his life, to sacrifice, he had to become a man. But, be, but to be the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he has to be very God, a very God. His death has to have that infinite value that comes with being. God of God, light of light, very God of very God. And this is what your good shepherd has done for you. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus always.